Thanks so much, Pastor Landon. It's a joy to be able to be here with you and a neat opportunity to be able to share just about what God's been doing in my life and at Moody Aviation. Hope to give you just a little bit of an overview of some history and, and some detours and navigation along the way uh, for the purpose of really honoring our King. And uh, as uh, Pastor Landon shared, I'm not a pastor or the son of a pastor. I'm not a great orator. Uh, when I think of words that describe myself, it's more along the lines of farm boy, mechanic, pilot, uh, engineer. Um, none of those involve a lot of public speaking. Uh, actually, I, I'm probably more uh, at home in the back there with, with David running the slides than I am up in the front. Uh, I can remember even at a young age seeking to avoid public speaking so much that when I was called and in grade school we had to go up and, and memorize a poem and say it in front of the class. Uh, I picked the shortest poem that I could find and I still remember it to this day. The Lord in his wisdom made the fly and then forgot to tell us why. I, and then I sat down. That was it. Um, so because I'm not a great orator, let me just pray again. I'd like to just ask God to give me words to be able to share. Dear Lord, thank you for today. Uh, grateful for the opportunity to be able to uh, proclaim you and your faithfulness uh, to all generations. I ask that you would help me to be able to, to speak well, to speak clearly, uh, to have your words, and that uh, your words would be impactful to our hearts. It's in Jesus' name that I pray. Amen. So I am a man that has been impacted by Christ uh, and changed uh, drastically. I wouldn't be here today without that. Uh, when I first began on my journey, uh, my intent was to build my own kingdom uh, and uh, to design and build and fly a space plane. That's where my dreams were going. Uh, God took me on a very different direction as I was impacted by the word of Christ through college uh, in a Campus Crusade for Christ, was um, challenged by some believers to say, Jim, if you want your life to count for eternity, then you need to be involved in things that are eternal. And that's God, his word, and people's souls. And I thought about that for a long time. Uh, and as I went through college and I finally graduated, I realized that uh, I needed to change direction. I need to go in a different way than what I originally planned for my life. And so I want to tell you about some of that today and, and in doing so, just kind of the history of Moody Aviation and, and then my testimony towards the end. And so first, just starting off, what is Moody Aviation? Uh, Moody Aviation is not a sending organization, but a training organization. And we have the privilege to be able to work with young men and women who have a heart and a passion to serve the King and uh, to share uh, about the Lord around the world. Uh, and uh, we train missionaries who have that passion, uh, but a technical bent. Uh, and so we, we add on to the missions training with Bible and general education, uh, train them to be an aircraft mechanic and then uh, a pilot. And they use those gifts and the tools of aviation to then advance the cause of Christ around the world. Uh, and so it's been a joy to be a part of that for the last 23 years in various roles. Uh, started off uh, graduating from Moody Aviation as a pilot mechanic and then was asked to stay on short term for two years, uh, installing avionics in some of the airplanes. And that two years has now turned into now 23. So something changed there uh, that wasn't part of my plan, but definitely was the Lord's. Um, so uh, we, we offer a, a five-year Bachelor of Science in Missionary Aviation Technology, and it's a branch of the Moody Bible Institute of Chicago, which some of you might be familiar with, uh, located just uh, in Illinois. And so we are uh, not in Chicago. We're actually out in Spokane, Washington, and my family and I have been out there for the last 16 years since we moved from Tennessee. But because I'm more comfortable talking about uh, technical things, we're going to start off with just a little bit of a flight lesson. Uh, and uh, this is an aviation sectional chart uh, that is of the Spokane area out in Washington. And part of what we train our pilots to do is to, to navigate on cross countries uh, so that they're able to, to go from point A to point B 
uh, respond to medical emergencies or to take missionaries in to be able to, to share with a tribe or, or deliver Bibles, uh, sometimes even to do uh, emergency evacuations uh, in the event of terrorism or, or, or challenges that are there. And so many of the flights, oops, sorry about that, wrong way, will uh, go from point A to point B, everything goes according to plan, or at least mostly so. Uh, but then there are times where there's something that gets in the way, uh, whether that's unforecast weather uh, or a call uh, on route from what their normal plan is from a, from a base to say, hey, we have uh, a young woman who is in childbirth and it's not going well. She needs to get to a hospital or the baby and, and she may not make it. Uh, and, and our graduates have responded to many of those calls over the years. And even just in the last two weeks, I received a prayer letter from one of our recent graduates who was able to respond to such a call. And they were able to, to get there uh, just before their, their uh, night curfew and, and make it back to the, the main hospital. Uh, and both the baby and, and the, the woman survived. Uh, and it really makes a big impact in the lives of people as you're able to, to minister in tangible ways, uh, authentic help, uh, demonstrating that you care and that the Lord cares. And it opens up people's hearts in ways that they become then um, open to the gospel. Uh, the current uh, president of Mission Aviation Fellowship is a classmate of mine who graduated from Moody Aviation. And he just shared a prayer letter with me. Uh, how when he first started flying for MAF about 20 years ago that uh, there was a tribe that they flew into and, and just were beginning to, to translate the Bible and, and to, to offer just help to the community and, and demonstrate Christ's love. And now today, uh, that tribe is, has vibrant churches uh, and uh, proclaiming the gospel and even sharing with, with local tribes uh, around them. Uh, it makes an impact uh, in, in deep ways in people's lives. And so it's been, been fun not only to see life transformation in our students, but to be a part of seeing life transformation that happens throughout the world and in all the nations. Uh, and, and I'm encouraged by and look forward to the day that we get to gather together in heaven and, and see what Revelation talks about, where there'll be people from every tribe, tongue, and nation praising our King. Uh, because of what he has done and his faithfulness in, in the lives of his people. So part of this flight lesson involves that we, we uh, help our students to learn how to navigate on a cross country to deal with unforeseen circumstances or detours or, or diversions, we call them uh, on the flight side. And so we use what's called the five T's, time, turn, throttle, uh, twist, and talk. And so we'll, we'll equip the, stu the students with this mnemonic to help them think through uh, what do they do when they experience something that's unplanned. Uh, and the first thing that they need to do while they're flying, because they can't just pull over to their nearest cloud, uh, is they have to fly the airplane. They gotta continue making sure that that is safe as they go. Uh, but they, they need to know where they are and, and write down their time because position and time are everything to a pilot. Uh, as you think about if you're flying in a certain direction at a certain speed for a certain amount of time, then you can be pretty confident that you're going to end up at a given point B at a certain time. Um, and so they, they plot where they are. So, for example, where they need to make a turn so they don't go into this thunderstorm. Uh, then they, they turn to an estimated heading. They need to know their surroundings. They always need to have an out, a plan uh, of what, what do they do if. Uh, and then they, they think about their, their throttle uh, and we mean that by their altitude, but they need to change altitude as they're going a different direction based on weather or different terrain they're gonna encounter now or airspace that they might might fly over or through. And then twist, and that's not like the dance twist, but it's, it's twist your navigation instruments so that they can uh, appropriately navigate uh, with some additional resources electronically if they're available. And then talk, uh, yeah. let your support team know what's going on. Uh, that there's been a change in plans uh, and you're not able to, to execute what you originally had planned, but, but going to a plan B or C or Z22, as somebody says. Uh, and so we equip our students with tools to navigate unplanned uh, events as they fly. As I have taught a number of students over the years, uh, these five T's, I've often thought about my own life and found that I was 
pretty ill prepared to deal with nav de deviations uh, in the navigation of my own life. I don't have a set of five T's to go through when, when things don't go according to plan. And so I'm um, going to share some of that with you towards the end of our time. But as I talk about the, the navigations that come in life, I also realize that God uses those deviations in our lives often to teach us many lessons and to demonstrate his faithfulness. And so I want to talk just a little bit about the history of Moody Aviation that's been filled with twists and turns and detours along the way, uh, all of which God shows up and demonstrates himself as faithful. And he makes a way when there seems to be no way. Um, our founder is Paul Robinson, and uh, he was a, a young pastor uh, in New York and had a love for aviation. And uh, as, as he began uh, seeking where the Lord would be calling him uh, as he was preaching, he got a call into missions and really was looking for a way to, to tie his love for aviation uh, with his love for preaching. And that was solidified when he read of a, a young missionary couple uh, in, in Bolivia. And uh, I just want to read what, uh, what he quoted in a book that, that as he read this, it impacted his life. Wally Heron was a Bolivian Indian missionary who had tried desperately to get his pregnant wife to a hospital after complications in childbirth. They took her by ox cart to a riverbank, and for several days she sat in a dugout canoe and they brought her to a hospital. Unfortunately, she died, unable to reach the hospital in time. This dear woman needed more than medicine, she needed transportation. And Paul's vision to pursue mission aviation was born. I've already shared how some of our graduates have helped to prevent this uh, reoccurrence, uh, even just in the last month or so. Uh, and that happens on a regular basis. Uh, we have uh, Moody Aviation graduates that are serving around the world. Uh, literally, I think we've had more than a thousand graduates over the last 75 years that are serving uh, in almost 40 countries uh, with 130 different mission organizations. Uh, and it's really exciting just to, to think about that impact. Uh, and as, as God began to, to really tap on the heart of Paul Robinson to say, hey, there's, there's something more that I have for you. And I would like you to consider uh, going into mission aviation, which at that point really didn't even exist. Uh, there weren't mission aviation fellowship and JARS and uh, Wycliffe Bible translators didn't have an aviation arm yet. Um, but Paul began to pursue that and he started flying lessons. Uh, his big question to the Lord was, how am I going to pay for this? This is expensive. And there was a, a young businessman uh, at their local airport that said, hey, I would like to give you uh, access to my airplane and you can take flight lessons and you don't have to pay for it. Uh, the Lord provided it. It was amazing provision in Paul's life just as he was starting this journey as God showed up and made a way. Uh, four days after his first solo, which a solo is a big deal for a pilot as they get to go up without the, the instructor for the first time. And um, Pearl Harbor took place. And you can imagine that after Pearl Harbor, uh, that aviation in the United States was grounded. And Paul thought his dreams were being dashed to the ground. Uh, another detour. Uh, and yet in this detour, God was making a way yet again as he joined the Civil Air Patrol uh, and continued his work as a pastor. God used his time in the Civil Air Patrol to provide Paul's private pilot's license, his commercial pilot's license, uh, and his flight instructor rating. Uh, all, again, that he didn't have to pay for. It was really amazing how God was providing in that way. And then shortly after World War II, as it began to wind down, uh, the Lord began to, to really tap on his heart again to say, I'd like you to move forward now with the, the tools that you've been equipped with to uh, take this overseas. And so as many others were returning from the war, pilots who, who had been also uh, called upon the Lord to step out and begin some missionary aviation groups, um, Paul heard about a group called CAMP, or Christian Airmen's Missionary Fellowship, which is today known as MAF, Missionary Aviation Fellowship, which some of you may have heard about. Uh, and 
So Paul began talking with them, and, and uh, unfortunately, they said, I'm sorry, you're too old. You can't, we can't use you to go overseas anymore. Uh, and it's just another kind of a, a big roadblock in his way. Uh, but God used that roadblock really to change his direction and to take his passion to be able to, to do it himself, but to, be, to begin a multiplication ministry and to form an aviation training wing that would be geared specifically for training missionary pilots and mechanics. And so when he was denied, um, he was redirected and God made an alternate path, uh, a plan Z-22 as my, my uh, coworker likes to say. And as he was redirected, he took this vision to the Moody Bible Institute and presented uh, the, the desire to start a missionary training program that would equip students with the tools of aviation to advance the cause of Christ around the world. And as he presented that to the board, uh, some board members were so behind it, they said, yes, we believe in this. We'll buy the first airplanes to make this possible. Uh, and God's provision in the midst of a detour again was seen. Uh, pretty cool in the way that was working. So he became the first director back in 1946. And now for the last 75 years, Moody Aviation has been equipping and training missionary aviators. It's the longest running specifically missionary aviation training school uh, that exists in the U.S. And I think in the world that I'm aware of. So pretty exciting in what God has done. Uh, he started out in uh, the Chicago, Illinois area at Elmhurst. Uh, was a small airport there. And students would receive their Bible training uh, at the main campus in Chicago and then go out to the airport for their final year to get their, their pilot certification. While he was there the first four years, he traveled down and visited the South America and met a gentleman named Nate Saint. Uh, does anybody know that name? Yeah, okay. So Nate Saint uh, was known as a pilot with MAF and he flew Jim Elliott and, and three other men uh, into the Warani tribe uh, or the Aka Indians. Uh, they were eventually martyred uh, and their wives went back into that tribe uh, and have had deep impact. And that tribe is now sending missionaries uh, throughout their area. Uh, and they, they were impacted by mission aviation uh, and uh, their lives are now different. This is uh, if you've seen the, the movie, The End of the Spear, or if you'd like to find out more about that, watch the movie End of the Spear uh, or a movie called Grandfathers. Uh, their, their tribe was impacted so much that the, the film Grandfathers, the name comes from, it's the first time in their history that they actually had multiple generations. Because previous to being transformed by the gospel, uh, they, were, they were a tribe that would war against one another and revenge was huge uh, in their culture. And so people typically wouldn't live past the time where they could have children, let alone grandchildren. And so uh, my daughter uh, was actually had the opportunity with our youth group to travel down to this uh, tribe, the Warani Indians, and was baptized by one of the members of the killing party uh, of uh, the men who, who martyred these men. And he is a life that's been changed and impacted by the gospel of Christ because of the tools of aviation bringing that love into their, to their heart language. So when he came back, um, they found out that Elmhurst was going to have to be sold, another detour. Uh, they had to find another location to train, and they, they ended up moving to, to Wooddale. They were at Wooddale for a number of years, uh, and at the same time that their program was growing, uh, a, a small airport called Chicago O'Hare was also developing. And uh, you might be familiar with the Chicago O'Hare Airport, one of the busier ones in the world. Uh, it became uh, so large that as the, the pattern at Elmhurst, uh, in order to land at their training base, they could only go 300 feet above the ground, which is pretty, sh it's not very high. Uh, the normal traffic pattern is a thousand feet. So that gives you a little bit of an idea. They, they were getting kind of just pushed out of that area. So they began looking for another location and found uh, a place in Elizabethan, Tennessee, about 500 miles away from Chicago and the foothills of the Smoky Mountains, where they trained missionary pilots and mechanics for about 40 years. 
And then uh, another detour that took place was a small event called 9-11. Uh, not so small. It, it impacted the lives of many. It impacted Moody Bible Institute significantly as even the, the giving to 501c3s began to, to diminish uh, just because people didn't have funds and some of the changes that were there. Uh, aviation insurance began to skyrocket and the costs for Moody Aviation were, were going up in that way. Uh, and so unbeknownst to us uh, in Moody Aviation in Tennessee, there were considerations of closing down Moody Aviation uh, because of the expenses to conserve. And, and Moody had to sell some radio stations. They had to, to stop some Moody magazine. There were a number of things that they were doing to help conserve in, in that challenging time. And so they were ready to present to the board uh, the recommendation to close. But God had another plan in the midst of, of that challenging time. Uh, and so much so, God had been working on this. It didn't surprise him because three years before, there was a gentleman who had been calling Moody Aviation to say, would you start a sister school in Spokane, Washington, uh, and partner with Moody Bible Institute Spokane that was already out there? Uh, and we had said, sorry, no, we can't because we don't have the bandwidth to do two programs at once. Uh, he was persistent and he called back every year. And he called back to Chicago then, the final year, and talk to the leadership to say, hey, would you start a sister school here? Unbeknownst to him that they were considering closing down Moody Aviation in the next month. God's timing is amazing. The, the leadership team went out, visited, asked a lot of questions and said, you know what? We can transfer Moody from Elizabethan out to Spokane rather than close it. Uh, and the board approved that, which was amazing. But it was a challenging time. And the, the program had grown. There were 50 people who were deploying the program in Tennessee. Uh, moving out to Spokane, Washington, that went down to three. 53, do the same job. That was hard. Uh, how are we going to do this, Lord? I have no idea. Well, God made a way when there seemed to be no way. And um, worked in the hearts of a number of mission aviation organizations who had had Moody Aviation graduates serving with them for years. Uh, at that point in time, probably nearly half of the world's missionary aviators had been trained at Moody Aviation. Uh, and there was shared interest to see it continue. And so missions began to place pilots and mechanics on loan to Moody Aviation uh, to be able to be our instructors and, uh, in, in maintenance and flight and to help the operations work. And God has done amazing things. When people said, you will never do this again, uh, all the things that they said never to, guess what? God showed up and made a way. And so today, uh, we now have partnership as one of our core values uh, because Moody Aviation wouldn't exist without partnership. And I've seen collaboration in the body of Christ working in a way that, that we've never seen before, where we're pilots and mechanics from multiple mission organizations, MAF and JARS and Ethnos 360 and South America Mission and Proclaim Aviation, all come together for the single purpose of investing in missionary pilots to be able to go around the world and impact people for Christ. Uh, we now have more than 50 people who are investing in uh, these students because God made a way when there seemed to be no way. And so, we're in Spokane, Washington, and, and God has shown up in truly amazing ways over the last 20 years to preserve Moody Aviation and to allow the gospel to continue to go around the world. Love just to share some stories. Uh, even in, in some of that journey uh, along the way, um, when we moved to Spokane initially, there was no hangar for us. We didn't have a place to be able to park our airplanes or to have our students. And so as our um, director at that time went out and was beginning to work through the process of transitioning Moody Aviation over a two-year period out there. Uh, went up to, to every uh, hangar owner along the main road of Feltz Field to say, would you be willing to relocate to an infield hangar uh, and allow us to, to take your hangar over and, and train pilots and mechanics here for missionary service? You can imagine that wasn't very well received by most and the answer was, no, sorry, we can't. We're not going to do that. Um, but there was a small grassy area uh, along the southeast corner of Feltz Field that there were no hangars built on. And um, so Cecil called the airport commission 
and just requested, would we be able to build a hangar here? And they said, no, I'm sorry, you can't because it's zoned commercial non-aviation. Wait a minute, this is inside the airport fence and it's zoned non-aviation? That doesn't make sense. Well, said, could you ask to see if we could try uh, to do that? And they said, well, we'll see if we can get it on the airport commission meeting. We happen to be meeting this afternoon. Normally, it would take about six months, three to six months to get something on their, on their agenda to be able to talk through that. And so three hours later, he received a phone call back to say, yes, we were able to get it on the agenda. The, we discussed it with the board. They voted, rezoned the property, and you can build there. Amazing. And that had been sitting there for years uh, and people asking to build and the answers were always no. It was as if the Lord had his thumbprint on that piece of property just waiting for Moody Aviation to come. The story doesn't even end there. As the FAA found out that the airport was going to allow Moody Aviation to build there, they said, no, Moody can't build there. You need to let other people build there first who have been waiting longer. Uh, it's higher and better use because they're just a school and others are commercial operations. Well, the person, actually the, the people who had the first right to be able to build there, according to the FAA, on their own dime, flew to Olympia, Washington, took the airport commissioner and took the director of Moody Aviation and presented a case to the FAA of why they should not build there and why Moody should. Amazing. God put the right people in the right place at the right time. And we wondered, Lord, how are you going to do this? He showed up in amazing ways. And the FAA said, yes, okay, Moody can build there. And so the hangar that you see here is the, the front of that hangar. And you'll see uh, just in the lower left-hand corner of that picture, there's a, a rock pile. Uh, and just as the children of Israel were commanded to pick up 12 stones as they crossed the Jordan River and to, to build an altar of remembrance. Uh, we had 12 graduates of the first class that were trained uh, in Spokane. And they all went and got a rock and built just an altar of remembrance in the front of the hangar uh, to help people remember the faithfulness of our King. In the midst of any circumstances that we may face, God is still on his throne. No matter how hard they are, no matter how much it seems like we have no idea how this is going to work, if God is in it, stand out of the way because it's going to happen. Uh, and, and I've been amazed over the years to see God's faithfulness uh, throughout uh, the history of Moody Aviation. And even just thinking about the, my own family's history, um, it's God's faithfulness that allows me to stand here today. I'm not a speaker. Uh, but God has transformed my heart and my life. And so I can say a little bit more than the Lord and his wisdom made the fly and then forgot to tell us why. Um, God has a reason. And in his wisdom, he is shaping our lives so that we have the ability to proclaim his love uh, to the world, to our families, to our neighbors, uh, and to, to those in all the nations. When my wife and I first came to Moody Aviation, uh, I had previously graduated at uh, Ohio University as a mechanical engineer, but as I shared already, God had been directing to say, I want something different for you. Are you willing to follow me? Uh, I don't want you to go into engineering. I want you to go into missions in some way, shape, or form. I didn't even know about mission aviation yet, but I knew that that God had equipped me with some technical gifting and a passion for people and a passion for his word. And we began trusting and following. And the Lord led us to Moody Aviation, but he didn't provide the money for it yet. Uh, and it was a relatively expensive program in order to be trained as a, as a pilot and a mechanic. You can imagine that the, the cost of fuel and tools and all those things add up. Uh, we had $2,000 uh, in our bank account for m my wife and I and a, and a strong calling that we should go to Moody Aviation. And my wife asked, Jim, how are we going to pay for it? I said, I don't know, but I know that he's calling us to go there. My sister had shared with me to say, Jim, where he leads, he feeds and where he guides, he provides. And I thought about that long and hard and said, OK, I'll follow, even though I don't know where the provision is going to come from. 
we got the first bill for our tool set and that wiped out the $2,000. There was nothing left. Uh, partway through our, our first uh, semester at Moody Aviation down in Tennessee, uh, we, had, we had nothing left to pay the bills and I was behind on the payment plan. I went and talked with the Dean of Students, Mr. Wheeler, and just shared with him, Mr. Wheeler, I think I'm gonna have to drop out of school because we don't have the, the funds to keep moving forward. And he did something that I'll never forget and I didn't expect. He said, Jim, well, let's just pray and thank God for what he's gonna do. Wait a minute, <laughs> that's not what I was expecting. And so he prayed a simple prayer. Lord, thank you for what you're gonna do in Jim and Suzanne's life and we just entrust them to you. And so I walked out of his office a little bit dumbfounded because I expected I was gonna have to go find a job and raise some money and come back. And, but he, he said, no, that's not what you're gonna do. I went home that evening and uh, a gentleman from our church stopped by with a truckload of firewood split and he just said, hey, uh, I know that you're gonna have to heat with wood this, uh, this winter and I have seven more truckloads tomorrow uh, all split, ready to go. I just need your help to unload it. Okay, sure, yeah, I'll, I'll help unload that. Uh, he brought the, the, all of the, the loads of the wood. And then afternoon on Saturday, the next day, um, there was another gentleman from our church that showed up with a, a box of food. Literally, it was about two foot by two foot by two foot, turkey and all the fixings. He said, Jim, I've not had a chance to be neighborly yet. Here you go. Wow, okay, <laughs> thanks. Sunday afternoon, received a phone call from my grandma. We were just talking and, and uh, then she asked out of the blue, by the way, how are your finances going? And I said, well, um, we're gonna have to drop out of school because we don't have the funds to continue. I wasn't getting the message of what God was trying to tell me yet. And uh, she said, well, how much do you owe? And, and I told her and conversation continued. By Thursday of that week, uh, there was a check in the mail and you know how much the check was for it was to be able to pay for the rest of that term. And when I opened that envelope up, it was like the Lord was just tapping me on the shoulder and say, Jim, I just want you to trust me. I'm your provider, I'm your sustainer. Uh, it's my job to make sure that you're fed. It's my job to make sure that you have a roof over your head and that you have wood to burn to keep your family warm. And it's my job to provide the finances. It's your job to follow even when you don't understand. I'd like to say that at that point in time, that's the last time I had to learn that lesson. But time and time again, I've had to learn that lesson over and over and over. And every time, God has proven himself faithful. When it doesn't seem possible to move forward, God shows up and makes a way. Uh, and and that's what gives me confidence to stand here even today. It's like, oh, get in front of people and talk. <laughs> no, but I can talk about our king and give glory to him. And, and that is an amazing thing to be able to do. Uh, because he is real. He is faithful. And we can trust him. No matter what. No matter what. In the world in which we, we live, it's a hard place to live. Things don't always work out the way that we want them to. Or maybe we should say things always don't work out the way we want them to. Uh, pretty much most of the time. But God is in control. And he continues to work in and through our lives so that we have the privilege to be able to share the hope that's within us with those around us. And I'm convinced more and more that he allows us to go through the hard times so that we can respond in a way that's different than what the world responds in. Trusting our king, even when we don't understand. Trusting our key, king, even when it's hard. And when people see that, they get hungry for what we have. Because there's something about our king working in those ways that people, that transform people's lives. And that's a joy to be a part of. Hebrews 10.23 is one of my favorite verses. It says, let us draw near with a sincere heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled clean from the evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering for he who promised is faithful. 
Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. We can take that promise to the bank. Um, it doesn't mean that he's going to give us everything that we want, um, because everything that we want isn't good for us. But he is going to work in our lives in such a way to, to mold us into the image of his son so that when we appear before him, we'll have the privilege to be able to hear, well done, good and faithful servant. Uh, and that's part of what drives my heart, uh, to be able to hear those words, to be able to see our king and stand before him someday. Uh, and I look forward to seeing uh, what the impact of Moody Aviation has been over the last 75 years. Uh, as I shared that there have been more than 1,000 graduates that are serving in nearly 40 countries with 130 different mission organizations um, that all began with a detour in the life of Paul Robinson. Paul could have gone and been one person, one family to impact in one location in the world. But because God chose that detour uh, and Paul chose to follow, literally thousands of lives have been impacted uh, in ripple effects that, that go around the world, around the globe. Uh, and that's exciting. It's really exciting just to be able to think about that, that impact. As I think through the concept of diversions, um, we train for them in the air. I was never trained to handle a deviation in life. But as I've thought about the five T's, uh, there are some things that I've learned that in every deviation, the Lord does one of three things, typically. He's using that deviation to provide for us in a way that we wouldn't have expected otherwise. Uh, he often uses it to protect us from often our own desires uh, or things that it would be very dangerous for to be a part of. And he directs us in alternate ways and to prepare us. Uh, and while I don't like the school of hard knocks, uh, sometimes those deviations that take us through some pretty challenging roads uh, are meant to prepare us and equip us so that we have the ability to relate to others who might be going through some challenging times and to share God's faithfulness with them because he is faithful uh, and we can trust him. And, and there's power in that uh, as, as his people are willing to do so. So part of the instructor in me took the five T's and, and sought to apply some mnemonic to life that, that, that has been helpful for me. Uh, and I could come up with probably 22 T's uh, that we could use, but there's just five here. The first one is talk. And you'll notice it's totally opposite order from what we began with as a aviator. Uh, and this doesn't mean talk to your friends. It doesn't mean gossip about what's going on or complain about the challenges that we're facing. It means go to our king first in prayer. Uh, we're challenged to bring all things by prayer and supplication uh, to our king and to cast our cares and our anxieties on him because he cares for us. And he's ready and waiting to listen. Uh, and not only is he ready and waiting to listen, he has the power to make a difference about it. Someone shared with me once that prayer is the nerve that moves the muscle of omnipotence. That's a pretty amazing concept. That, that the prayers that we're able to offer to our king uh, are able to move the God of the universe who is all-powerful. And it doesn't mean that, that he's a genie in the bottle at our beck and command. It means that when we bring our cares before him, He's able to do something in our lives that can help us. And he doesn't always change the situation, but he does change us and molds us into the image of his son. So bring our cares before our king. Start with prayer um, rather than being at the last thing that we, we would go to. Truth is the second T. It's essential that we, on a, on a daily and a routine basis, be writing God's word on our heart uh, so that we would be able to discern truths from lies that are in this culture. Uh, there are um, so many times where the enemy takes what seems to be a truth and 
coats it with something that taints it and twists it even just slightly. And it can become very dangerous if we are believing that so-called truth, but really is a lie in our lives. And it can make us uh, feel shameful. Uh, it can drive us into isolation uh, rather than into community uh, and, and to our king. It's essential that we know God's truth and to speak that into our lives on a daily basis and to one another so that we can sharpen one another as iron sharpens iron uh, to be able to become more like our king each day. Next, he is trustworthy. God is trustworthy. He has demonstrated himself faithful for generations to his people. Uh, and he continues to do that each and every day in our lives. And while I know that to be true in my brain, it's often so hard to really apply that to daily life in my heart and walk in that way. And that's why the fourth T is trust. It means put our faith in action and have the courage to go wherever it is that he's leading us, knowing that, that as he leads, he feeds, and where he guides, he provides. Uh, it's our job to follow. And then the last one is temporary. Remembering that whatever challenges that we face on this earth, uh, they're temporary. And there's nothing that we face that, is, that can even be compared to the surpassing knowledge of knowing Christ and being able to spend eternity with him. So as we think through navigating um, the, the challenges in life, remember that they're, they're to provide, to protect, uh, and even to prepare us, and the importance of going to our Lord in prayer, talking to him, uh, meditating on his truth, remembering that he's trustworthy, that we can trust him in action, uh, and it's temporary. And we will see our king soon uh, as we move forward. As you think about Moody Aviation and the graduates of Moody Aviation that go around the world, I'd ask you that you'd be praying for them uh, because they're facing these deviations each and every day. Uh, received a message from one of our graduates and one of my friends who's serving uh, in some very challenging parts of the world right now uh, and dealing every day with the, the threats of, of terrorism, uh, with the challenges uh, of the, that come in, in living in war-torn countries, uh, but there are lives that are being impacted for Christ. So pray for courage, pray for sustaining power, uh, and pray for the Lord's name to be glorified uh, literally around the world uh, as Moody graduates are, are instrumental in being able to, to take the, the word of Christ into remote and isolated places that otherwise wouldn't have that opportunity to hear. And so it's been a joy and an honor to be able to, to share with you. I hope that it that has been impactful. Um, thanks for uh, your grace to listen to me, someone who's not a speaker, uh, but I pray that, that my testimony uh, brings glory and honor to our King. Uh, because he's the one who's faithful, and that's why we're all here today. Can I just pray for our time as we wrap it up? Dear Lord, thank you for today. Thank you that you are faithful. Thank you that we can trust you and that you have the power to make a difference in our lives. I ask that you'd go before us and prepare the way and that you would uh, remind us that no matter what we face, uh, you are with us, uh, and that is an amazing gift. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Were you guys encouraged? I was. Thank you, Jim. There's power in testimony. I think it's good for us uh, who know the king to share king's stories. Because God is still on the move. He's still alive. He's still up to much. So we got about 10 minutes left. And I want to take this time just to whet your appetites concerning Romans chapter 8. So why don't you turn there quickly in your Bibles. Um... We're going to be spending the next month uh, in Romans 8. Some of you guys know it's my favorite chapter in the Bible. Some of you guys know it's the only chapter I've ever memorized in the Bible. So we're going to spend five, six, seven, eight studies in Romans chapter 8. And it's beautiful because it really talks about 
the life that we have as believers in the Spirit and how important that is. And you guys can testify when she came to faith in Christ and you're born again of the Spirit. That's the game changer. Your eyes are open, everything. You're a new creation. She's like, I didn't think this was possible, but that's God. <laughs> you know, he does the impossible. All things become new. And that's what we get to live in, guys. So um, let me pull up for you guys. I got a couple slides. We're going to look at just a few scriptures together here. Um, but we'll take a read of Romans 8.1 here. It says, There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. And I want to read just the next few verses. It says, For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh, God did by sending his Son in the likeness of sinful flesh on the account of sin. He condemned sin in the flesh that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. This is truth. This is good for you and I as believers. And I love the therefore, okay? Because what have we studied over the last seven months in the book of Romans, okay? Therefore, we have all fallen short of the glory of God. We have all sinned, but there's a Savior Okay, though we have the sin nature in Adam where there is condemnation, we are in Christ because of his sacrifice. Sins have been forgiven and we can live with no condemnation. Okay, it's a beautiful thing. And you guys can jot down chapter 3, verse 20, because there's that other big therefore that we found in the book of Romans. No flesh will be justified. It can't happen apart from Christ. So as we consider living under the law, okay, a lot of people want to do that. That's what religion does. Do you guys know that religion is all about laws and regulation? We see it. There are religions all over the world. Every religion in the world says you have to do this in order to be right or to get to heaven. The Bible teaches that we can't do it. We've all fallen short. We can't keep the law, but Christ fulfilled it. He did it all on our behalf and all we can do is receive the gift of salvation of eternal life through him he alone is savior so when we consider the law it only leads to failure do you guys understand that it leads to condemnation i feel and you guys can testify we know people who live in that religion under those rules under the law they are constantly defeated they're trying so hard to do what's right and they keep failing and what does the law do well we're told in galatians the law is there as a tutor or a schoolmaster to point us to who to jesus because it's all about him so living under the spirit which is why romans 8 is so cool because we've only heard one mention of the holy spirit thus far in romans and now in chapter 8 32 times he's going to show up and life with him is so important and one bummer i see in the church today is we talk about god the father we talk about god the son jesus so much but the holy spirit isn't talked about that much but he is there we're in relationship he's the one who makes us new in christ he walks with us. He's our comforter. He's the one who speaks truth. So when we live a life under the Spirit, it leads us to Jesus. It leads us to freedom. And that's what God wants us, you know, to be about, about his business, being free to do whatever he asks. That's why I love Jim's testimony. Man, we're open, Lord. We're available. Whatever you want. And God provided and led. And look at how many years of faithful service. You know, praise the Lord. And that's one of those things. That's all God wants from us. Are we open? Are we available? Are we who profess Christ and have been born again? Are we grieving the Spirit? We, I, I know you're asking. I know you're leading. But I don't want to yield right now. That's on us. God's never going to force anybody to do anything. Okay, He gives us that choice. He loves us and he calls us in to what he's up to and let me tell you what guys there's nothing better than what god's up to it's fun isn't it fun jim just to see firsthand the things god's up to it's yeah just go for it testimony it's great so 
as we consider Jesus fulfilling the law, okay, you are now. Did you guys catch that in verse 1? There is therefore now. A lot of times we think, well, condemnation, I have to live in it until I die. Because then I can live in heaven with God and there will be no con- No, it's now. If you are in Christ, there is no condemnation right now. But so many of us, we live in it. We live in shame. We live in in guilt okay but the reality is if you're in christ born again in the spirit of god you have no condemnation christ paid it all guys that's the truth of the gospel do you guys know that the term christian is only used three times by paul in his epistles three times 216 times we as believers are referred to those who are in him in christ in the beloved and that's all that matters guys because there's a lot of christians i'm a christian doesn't mean you're going to heaven do you guys understand that there are many matthew chapter 7 verse 21 will say in that day lord lord i give lip service to you but jesus is going to say to them you can call me lord all day long (laughs) depart from me i never knew you okay it's not about the religious things we do it's all about him and being in relationship with him. That's what he cares about. And that's why we read things like this over and over in the scriptures. There's no condemnation to who? Those who are in relationship, who've been bought with the blood of the lamb, who know Jesus, okay? When they're in Christ, there is no condemnation. It's beautiful. So the now is huge. In condemnation, I want to talk about for a moment. Okay? That's judgment. And there's a lot of judgment going on in the world today. A lot of finger pointing. We see it. It's of the world. Satan's good at it. He's the accuser of the brethren. So we consider condemnation, the judgment, the punishment. And we do it to ourselves. Don't we condemn ourselves a lot? And we shouldn't. Because what does Romans 8.1 tell us? There's no condemnation. Well, I'm going to argue with God. <laughs> you got, you're wrong because I'm going to condemn myself. No, he's right. So knock it off. Okay, we should not be condemning ourselves if we're in Christ Jesus. Also, we have the mentality that hey, God is gracious, but that grace isn't actually for me. It's good for you, but not for me. No, God is gracious to all. Okay, and it's there, grace upon grace. But are we going to receive it by faith? And that takes humility, doesn't it? God resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. And when we humbly come before his throne of grace in time of need, the grace is there. Our God is a giver by nature. God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son. That's our God. He's a giver. Also, guys, as we consider um, condemnation, uh, people find themselves in a had this happen in counseling i don't know how many time over the years i just can't forgive myself you know anybody like that i just you've been forgiven god has forgiven you (laughs) forgive yourself you're not greater than god if god has forgiven you you can forgive yourself okay we need to move on okay and we you know (laughs) being my own archaeologist i love to dig up my past okay (laughs) Old things have passed away, right? Behold, all things become new, 2 Corinthians 5, 17. We're to walk in that newness of life. Sonny and I last week went through uh, Corey Ten Boom's uh, Tramp for the Lord, okay? Phenomenal sister in the Lord. God took her all over the world. Uh, She housed a bunch of Jews during the Holocaust, got thrown into prison. A lot of you guys have read her story. But she wrote another book of her latter part in the year of her life, But anyways, towards the end of the book, she shares a quote as she was having a conversation with somebody. She was talking about how God takes our sins and throws them in the depths of the sea. And then she said, but don't go fishing back there. (laughs) Like in other words, don't go back and pull that stuff up. It's gone. As far as the east is from the west, that's how far God has moved our transgressions. Okay? You are set free. Walk in the newness of life, guys. And that's been the beautiful part of Romans thus far okay so we've been buried with christ don't dig up the old past okay there are no records of wrong it's been cleaned okay um 
But Satan likes to condemn us, doesn't he? So when we do feel condemned, we need to recognize where that is coming from. I want you guys to look with me at John chapter 8 here. Verse 44, it says, You are a father of the devil. Okay? So the Bible makes it pretty clear. I've heard people say we're all children of God. That's very unbiblical. Okay? If you're not born again in the Spirit of God, the Bible says you're actually a child of Satan. Okay? And you don't come to the gospel because Satan's blinded you. Literally, there's a spiritual blindness going on. But we're told here <clears throat> that you're the father of the devil and the desires of your father that you want to do. And he has a, he's been a murderer from the beginning. And he does not stand in truth because there's no truth in him. And when he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own resources, for he is a liar and a father of it. There's a lot of lies out there, isn't there, guys? There's a lot of noise coming at us all the time. Fake news here, fake news there. <laughs> this group saying this, that group saying this. Even within the church, well, you say this is true, and you say this is true. Who's right? Do you guys know that God's the one who's right? <laughs> He's right. We're told also in Isaiah chapter 5, verse 20, Woe to those who call evil good. And good evil. How many of you guys would say that's happening today? Okay, there are things that we are calling good that God says is sin. We're saying we know better than you, God. Our opinions are what matter. You're wrong. We're right. We're progressive. Catch up, God. Who put darkness for light and light for darkness. Who put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. We're living in those days. And check out this last passage of scripture from Revelation 12, verse 10. It says, Then I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ have come for the accuser, this is speaking of Satan, of our brethren. So those who come and accuse the saints of God, believers in Christ, okay, who accuse them before our God day and night, He's been cast down, and they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb. Jesus died on that cross for our skies. Okay, we've been forgiven. Satan has, he can accuse all day long. <laughs> he has nothing on us. We've been bought with a great price, the blood of Jesus Christ. And did you guys catch the last part? The word of their testimony. Okay, there's power in that. Here and our brother just share this morning on what God's done in his life. There's power in that. We need to be sharing with others what God is doing. Yesterday as we celebrated the life of Beth, just hearing her Christian testimony, she loved the Lord. Okay, There's power in that. And they did not love their lives to the death. Yeah, we have brothers and sisters who will die today for their faith in Christ. That is a reality. But the reality here, guys, is we as Christians, we're not to live in condemnation. Okay, We get to live for the Lord and on to him. Because what does condemnation really do? It leaves us hopeless, doesn't it? Hopeless. That's where the world's at. They're looking for hope. They're grasping for hope. And we have the hope of the world to share. We get to be hope dealers. You guys understand that. It's our job. We got the gospel. We got the good news. We have the answers. Okay. Um, conviction. I want to clarify is a little different than condemnation, isn't it? Conviction is actually a hopeful thing. It's a good thing. When the Holy Spirit convinces us of truth, we find hope in that. We invite conviction. It's crazy. There's times when we're just studying the Bible. We're a very simple church. We're just going to work through God's word. Okay? And in that, there's sometimes people are super convicted where someone else is super encouraged. You know? Some person might be condemned, you know, in that message. And another person is really built up and set free. It's one of those things where are we in relationship to the Lord? Are we in agreement with him or not? Are we born again of the Spirit of God or not? So when we are, conviction is well received because, yeah, we know you're good, God. We know your ways are better. They're right. You're wiser. I've done the hard way. <laughs> I've experienced that. And guess what? You were right. You're good. 
Conviction, we welcome it. Are there consequences? Absolutely. Is correction needed? Absolutely. Those things are good in the life of a Christian. But condemnation has no place in the life of a Christian. So if you've been condemning yourself or you're allowing Satan to condemn you, stand in truth. Stand in truth. I want to wrap up just considering our culture for a moment. We have traditional theory. We know God's ways are good, okay? He's building something since the creation, okay? Things have been building. The church, we think of family, we think of business, marriage, gender. These are things that he's built up. These are his way. But we live in a day where everything is being critically looked at, okay? Critical theory is out there, and what that does is want to tear down what someone else has built. So we have the accuser, Satan, okay? And he started as God's first critic, right? He questioned, has God really said? And that's what he's been doing since creation, questioning God. And he is the God of this world. He is deceiving people. He is blinding people. And he wants to declare, hey, we can have heaven here on earth just without God. We just need to do it my way, this way. Believe these lies, you know. And there's so much out there today. There's so much hate, so much judgment. It is so gross. And why? It's because Satan, he is a confuser. He doesn't want anybody to have any clue to what truth might be. I mean, to the point we're teaching our children today, there is no God. We send them to school. What are they learning? There is no God. Nothing blew up billions and billions of years ago. That's how foolish we've gotten, guys. But that's because Satan's good at what he does. He's the father of lies. And his children, they just go along with the lies. And that's where we guys get to stand in truth, okay? Because we can't have heaven on earth without God. Because if God's not there, there is no heaven. When the kingdom of heaven comes near to us, it's because of Jesus Christ. You guys understand that? Wherever the king is, that's where heaven is. So if he is in us, <laughs> okay, that kingdom reality we get to bring to the world and share with the world. There's a lot of counterfeit justice today. Okay, and the mentality that we are God. It's all about us and our opinions is what matters. That's just pride, guys. And that's why Satan himself fell. So worldliness, it's all around us. We see it in our education. You can turn on the television, media, social media. It's everywhere. And we're living in a time of cancel culture. Everybody's canceling each other out. We think sometimes it's just us as Christians. We speak up for Jesus and they want to cancel us. No, we're just canceling everything. It's crazy what's going on today. But you know what? You can't cancel Jesus. That's the truth. The gospel is going to continue to go forth. You know, if you've been canceled, praise the Lord. Keep shining. Keep sharing. People need the gospel, guys. They need the hope of Jesus Christ. And that's what we get to share. And I love this statement. There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. Not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. And brothers and sisters, we simply walk with our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. The gospel is going to be lived out in a beautiful witness to this world that is looking for truth. There's people who want hope. They want to know. And we have the truth. Let's not give ourselves to the things of this world. Life is short. We, I love that song, Soon and Very Soon. We sang that earlier. Life's going quick, guys. Life's going quick. We get one life. Let's not waste it. Let's live for the Lord. A couple of closing thoughts here. Would you guys agree life with the Holy Spirit's better? That's what Romans 8 is really going to provoke us in. Okay, We're going to take a deep dive and really consider that. And I hope you guys are encouraged. So your homework is to start reading the chapter, okay? I'd love for you guys to read it through a couple times before next Sunday. Um, also, do you guys know that Jesus did not come to condemn the world, okay? But to save the world. 
that scripture is the verse right after John 3.16. Okay? A lot of people look at Jesus. All he wants to do is condemn me. No. God loves you. You're condemned already. <laughs> God came to save us. Okay? To free us that we would not be condemned. Also, guys... Um, The work Jesus did on the cross, it's finished. There's nothing we can do. There's people that walk around with the mentality, a lot of Christians, I need to do this to make God proud. No, <laughs> you can't do it, okay? Being in Christ, your faith is beautiful to God. We believe Jesus has done it all. It is finished. And we live, uh, <laughs> we live in his love, not for his love. Okay, do you guys understand that? It's from what he has done. We love him. We love him because he first loved us. It's a response to him. Okay, he loves you. So we don't have to be striving. Okay, we just get to be rescued. You understand that? I don't know about you guys. I feel like I need rescuing every day. There's times I'm like, <laughs> every day it's a, it's a heart cry. Lord, help. <laughs> I need you. And he's faithful to save, guys. So I encourage you, please spend some time in Romans 8, and I'm excited this next month to go through that with you guys. Uh, so next week, we'll be jumping in. The following week, our brother Sam is going to be teaching, uh, so be praying for him. I'm excited about that. I'll be on the 8th. The churches are going to be camping in tents. Um, the last time we camped, we had a huge windstorm come through South Dakota, and it blew our tent over and tore it apart. It was crazy, but that's what memories are made of, right? So... Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for this morning. God, it's been a, uh, just a gift to be able to gather with brothers and sisters to worship you together. We thank you so much for our brother. Uh, Jim just coming this morning and just sharing his story. We just thank you so much for him and his family. Just bless those guys and their efforts for you. Just thank you for their faithful service and just your faithfulness towards them. God, we thank you that you are faithful to us that you're there for us. I pray for each and every one of us here and those watching online. God, may you just open our hearts and our eyes more to just see how glorious and wonderful you are. God, that we would be growing in faith, growing in your grace, growing in knowing you better, Jesus. That's what it's all about. Thank you so much for your faithfulness over the centuries, God, that the Great Commission is being fulfilled today. We think of those brothers and sisters all over the world just serving God, preaching the good news. We think about our brothers and sisters who are being persecuted today, those who are in jails today. Father, be strong on their behalf. Give them boldness to stand in the truth. God, thank you so much that you are Savior, that you are mighty to save. It's in your name we pray, Jesus. Amen.